good afternoon. Um, well, there's more people here than, I, than uh, there were when I was up here a few minutes ago. Good to see everybody. Um, my name is Jason, and uh, I have the privilege of sharing my thoughts with you on going deep. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the, the topic I was given to talk to you just said iceberg, and I knew what it meant. So do you know this metaphor, the iceberg? You know this? There's more beneath the surface than is on top. Uh, most, most of an iceberg is actually underwater, if you didn't know that. So we've, we've been discussing emotional health, and this is that part of being emotionally healthy uh, that I don't like so much. Um, but I think we have a lot of help in Scripture uh, on, on this front. Um, so uh, I, I don't have slides for you on the actual passage. If there's any way you could have my volume turned down just a smidge, that'd be amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, so if you have the text with you, turn to Genesis chapter 32, though we're actually going to begin at the end of 31, but it's probably easier to just go right to 32. Sorry, 32. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I've... I feel like the idea of, of going deep into my own life with God is quite frightening. Um, I've spent a lot of time, I, it's clear to me now, but I've spent a lot of time going deep into the Bible, but that wasn't the same as going deep with God. Does that make sense to you? You can go very, very deep into Scripture and yet somehow miss God, which is very frightening. And it happens, I think, to the best of us. Uh, but so f for me, I think for, for a long time, I thought that when one uh, became a Christian, uh, they could forget about the life they lived prior to that moment if it is, in fact, one moment where we, we believe and we become a Christian. At that point, we're, we're a new being, and whatever went behind is over. And now it's a matter of pressing forward and forgetting what's behind. It sounds really good, doesn't it? It sounds almost correct. I think I imagined that growth in the Lord looked like um, just disciplining myself and exerting as much energy as I could to my own growth. My own growth with God was a matter of repentance, discipline, willpower, and some help from friends. Also sounds just about right. I think m many Christians actually think this way. I'm a Christian now. What, what, what happened before this moment no longer is in play. I am a new creation in Christ. But that might not mean what we think it means. I think, in my experience, Christians about my age, making a feeble attempt for however many years like I have to follow Jesus, we're discovering that it's, in fact, quite complicated. <laughs> There's more to our lives than our own ability. There's more to our growth with God than our own ability. And I don't think most of us would say we don't need to confront things in our past. I think most people know that that's probably true, but we don't know where to begin. <laughs> And so rather than get hung up on the, the negative, discouraging realities of, of, our, of our history, we try to pretend like they don't exist, and we move forward. The problem is, we are historical creatures. And how we live our lives is, has much to do with what's happened in and to and through us in our past. Does that make sense? We live our lives moving forward with God with some of the same 
ways of approaching life, ways of thinking about God, ways of dealing with hurts, all of those things go back quite a ways. And I think, again, there's, a, there's this wonderful, very simple, but wonderful passage in the second letter, uh, I guess it was 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, where Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. Is you, you are a part of a brand new reality brought to you by the resurrection of our Lord. But what he doesn't mean what he cannot mean is that the reset button has been hit and that whatever went before is gone and now we're new. This is helpful to me. Grace is not a time machine. Grace is not a reset button. Grace is something even more unbelievable. It's a restoration. It's a reconciliation of and despite our histories of animosity. Grace is not an undoing, it's an overcoming. See, God wants to heal us from the things that have happened in us and to us. It's how God is. He is invasive in our life. He gets involved at the deepest possible levels. Those levels which we are, are very happy to keep him away from and just keep coming to church and going to our daily devotional practices like good Christians, all the while kind of being elusive with God. And if, that's, if, we, if we live like that, then some of the wounds in our life will continue to inform the way we live, like it or not, new creation or not. And that's part of what it means to inhabit the new creation, is to be whole and healed. That's why the Christian life isn't merely a matter of a transaction. Some one thing happens and there, salvation, it's over. But our lives are being transformed throughout our lives. It's not just one minute and everything is fixed. God works in and with us throughout the course of our believing lives. And it ain't necessarily for the, the, the weak of heart. It takes some serious trust in, in my experience. But focusing on our pasts, how many of you, you hear me saying this, and immediately you're thinking, well, that does not sound healthy. I've done that before. And I don't think the last thing we need is now to drudge up our pasts and focus on all the painful things that have happened to us. To which I would say, amen, exactly. Because this needs to be brought into careful ten tension with the new creation, the new reality which we inhabit in Christ. And this is where we need the Lord's help. Now, there's another end of this spectrum. Not only that our histories wound us and deform our humanity and make us sort of live life with a limp that we needn't have, but we, the other end of this spectrum is we can idealize our pasts. You familiar with this? Now, those of you who know me well, which isn't many of you, I realize, because I'm still quite new here, uh, but you'll discover that I have an unhealthy obsession with uh, Air Jordans uh, beginning at 1984 and ending at about 1995. Um, and there's a reason for that I'm discovering. Like, I know more about shoes I can't afford than anybody. <laughs> because there was a moment in my life when I got a pair of Jordans after wanting them so badly. And it was the purest time in my life. I want that. I want Jordans. I'm like, look at me. I'm a 43-year-old guy walking around wearing the same shoes I wore in fifth grade, thinking that's normal. <laughs> but, but it's because of what the, these Jordans, these shoes mean to me. They signal a time in my life when things were very simple, very beautiful, very easy. And we do that. But we can get stuck 
there. Institutions get stuck there. Churches get stuck there. Always looking back. I want to go back to that. Well, you're different now. I don't care. We can do that again. Let's recreate what we used to have. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way in our personal lives either. We can be stuck looking back, imagining that if we could just get back to the way things are, things would be better. But we don't realize what we're trading in when we think like that. All of the things that you have now in your life, wounds, victories, abilities, skills, gifts, people, everything you have, you'd be trading in to go back. The, the word for this is nostalgia. Do you know this word? It's dangerous. It's really dangerous. It's not just a cute way of remembering the past. It's a way of being stuck and imagining that the best that God has for our lives is somewhere back there. Also, we forget that our lives back there actually were also jacked up. <laughs> there was also pain and loss and grief back there too. Does this make sense? So some of, I think, some of us need to be self-included. I'm working on this. This is not easy. We need to be liberated from our obsession with the way things used to be so that we can embrace God's direction in our lives. I think that's why I've had a hard time for years now. Uh, you know, I... I uh, I volunteered to do full-time ministry, and I've moved a lot. Uh, in the last five years especially, I've moved a lot. And I look around, and I'm like, I didn't sign up. Well, like, I'm, where's my home? Like, I didn't sign up to be dislocated. I didn't want to always feel like my life is changing. I, I want to go home where people know me, where I know the landscape, and I have my favorite places. I want to go back there. But I've realized that that impulse in me is my, me living out of my own wounds and fears about embracing where I am. And so I end up missing that God has been with me, bringing me to where I am. I don't know if that resonates with you. But, but we cannot embrace what God is doing in our lives, in and around us, if we are obsessed with an idealized vision of our pasts. Smith, again, this is great. Smith's new book on time. I recommend it if you're up for a deep read. Sometimes the most faithful act of remembering requires a deconstruction of our nostalgias. Sometimes the most creative act of remembering is to ruin the illusions we've learned to live with. That is, letting our vision of the past stand in the light of God's goodness and, and being confronted with the question, what do you want to do here? Do you want to trust God and move forward? Or do you want to stay connected to something that cannot be? So sometimes the most faithful thing is to tear down illusions that are in fact not helping us live in and live faithfully present with God. But there is, I mean, there are, okay, so uh, what's the answer here? <laughs> there are a number of ways in my life that I resist God's help, especially with the past. You want to know the greatest way I reject God's help? Busyness. And I don't mean I do a ton of things. I'm not like a guy always in little, involved in projects. But my mind is loud. It is loud and noisy. For every thought that you have, I feel like I have 5,000 to match you. My head is like, I'm like held hostage by my thinking, my thought life. And it takes a lot of work to stop talking over God for me. It takes a lot of work to be quiet enough to maybe hear even a whisper from God. Or, or I'm sorry, to hear God screaming, <laughs> let alone a whisper. 
but I got so much going on in my head that I often can't even hear anything God might be saying or doing or leading me toward. It's, I think, one of the primary ways we resist God is having uh, unstilled minds. And I think, because I, here's the thing, I think to confront going deep as the topic of the sermon, going deep requires God's help. Because there are things in our lives that not only can't we articulate and talk about well, we're not even aware of. We're going to see a story of that today. There are things in our lives that we wouldn't even be able to talk about and get help with if we had the, the will to do so. Because we're not even aware they're there. God knows and God can actually heal. God can get involved at the deepest levels of our life to bring healing, to address and dress our wounds, if we allow them. But my point is, we need God. You know, in February, I'm sorry, January 23rd of this year, my younger brother died of a fentanyl overdose. And I presided over my younger brother's funeral. I gave the eulogy. I don't even know where to begin to tell you about that. I don't even know how to articulate what that did to me and in me. It's going to take a lifetime to unravel that moment. I will be haunted for some time. And that doesn't mean I shouldn't try. I shouldn't talk about it. But I've discovered I need to sit with that before my God who can heal. And if I plan to find healing on areas of my, in areas of my life like this, I will need to shut up. I will need to settle down and allow God to address me. We all have these kinds of things in our life. You want to live with Christ? You will not be able to live on the surface of your life just singing hymns and studying Scripture. If you want to be faithful to the Scripture we read and honor the hymns we sing, you will need to open yourself up and go deep with God. And there's no way around that if you plan to actually grow. And that's why I said at the beginning, I'd rather that this wasn't the case. <laughs> I'd rather we could just grow by trying really hard and just get better and better at the Christian life. But this is so beautiful because this means that our lives before God unfold very slowly. We are not yet what we shall be as we give ourselves to God. How are you guys doing? You sure? I don't know if I am, but we'll see. Um, so uh, I want to share with you a story uh, from Genesis 32. And it's a story about uh, the character of the elect. It's a story about a first step on the road to transformation. It's a story about a person, a guy, who doesn't realize or doesn't trust that God is going to give him a blessing. It's a story, ultimately, we're going to discover about God's relationship with people, specifically chosen people. It's a story of Jacob. You're familiar with Jacob? Jacob, good guy or a bad guy? Show of hands. Good guy? Bad guy? <laughs> like you, good guy, are you a good person or a bad person? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We shouldn't imagine that just because their names are in the Bible, they're superhuman. We'll discover that. In fact, there is this wonderful uh, line that, that uh, threads the entire narrative of Scripture having to do with infertility and the barren woman. And Israel's first three matriarchs are all barren women. And the second of those, Rivka, uh, uh, Rebecca, uh, she is <laughs> infertile. Her husband prays for her and it's, the text shows us that God opens her womb and she finds herself uh, expecting with two boys in her womb. 
And while the kids are still inside of her, she says, oh, these kids are going to tear me apart. And the text says that they're wrestling one another within the womb. Sibling rivalry starts for these two brothers in utero. But when they emerge, the oldest comes out, hairy and red, and they name him Esav, Esau. And as he's coming out, a little hand pokes out, holding on to his older brother's heel, not so fast. And they call him Yaakov. Now, Yaakov uh, means something like, probably in its oldest form, God reigns. Uh, but it sounds a lot like and looks a lot like the word for heel. That is, your heel. And he grabs his brother's heel. So they call him Yaakov. Well, Yaakov is a mama's boy, and he wants to be the first in line, not his brother. This starts very early, right at the, the moment of uh, the delivery. We, we see this. Jacob, I'll, I'll spare you uh, my summary of, of all of Jacob's life, uh, but I will say that he gets really good at getting what he fears he won't get from God. He gets really good at manipulating the system, working angles in order to get ahead. And it turns out, through some deceptive uh, maneuvering and some help from mom, that he actually slides in in front of his brother and gets the birthright and the blessing from dad. When his dad is blind, and there's this moment where he dresses up like his older brother to trick his dad because his dad can't see well. And even so he smells and feels, he puts like goat hair on his arms so that if his dad touches him because he knows his brother, his older brother is hairy, like this will really fool dad. And, and dad actually asks him, Esau, my son? And Yaakov says, Ani, yeah, it's me. It's me. I'm Esau. And he gets the blessing. Well, his older brother ain't having it, so he has to go into a kind of exile. And he has to go all the way back to his, his uncle's home, back in Mesopotamia, a long ways away. As soon as he starts out to head back to get away from his brother so that he doesn't get killed, God meets him. God promises him, I will be with you. Now, if I were God, I wouldn't be with this guy. But I'm not God, thank God. God is faithful to Jacob because God is faithful. And he promises to go with Jacob into a long exile with his uncle. Jacob wakes from the dream wherein he saw God and he says, Bet El, this place is the house of God. In Hebrew, Bethel, this is the house of God. God is in this place. God is with me. And he goes, and there's a familiar trope in, in, in the Bible where guys meet their spouses at wells. I don't know what the modern day equivalent of a well is, but if you're looking to get married and you want to follow scripture, go there. <laughs> because it seems that that's where the heroes of the faith meet their spouse. Jacob stumbles upon a woman there named Rachel. And she is the daughter of his cousin. He falls in love. He falls in love so head over heels with Rachel. Right away, he starts crying. He's so in love with her. And he says, I'll work seven years if you let me marry your daughter. That will be how I, I pay you back for her. It's like, great. That's, we need help around the farm, so that's great. And then when he gets the daughter, you know how the story goes? He actually slides in the older daughter, Leah. And, and lo and behold, it says, Leah. <laughs> I didn't work seven years for Leah. I worked seven years for Raquel. I don't want the older sister. I want the younger. He says, well, we don't do things like that here. Another seven years. Pay up, buddy. Long story short, the deceiver spends 20 years in exile deceiving and being deceived. He tricks his, his uncle, his uncle tricks him, 
And in the process of the trickery and the rivalry and the deception and the manipulation, Jacob is increasing in wealth and his family is getting bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where he has 11 sons, the, t- the 12 tribes of Israel. And then in chapter 31, God returns after 20 long years to Yaakov and he says, time to go home. Time to face your past. Now, if you're Jacob, do you want to go home? What's happened in the last 20 years back home with the brother you cheated? You screwed him and now you got to go face him. If you were Jacob, what would you do? Would you go 20 years, could, a lot could happen in 20 years. You can get more entrenched in your anger or you could learn to open up and forgive. But there's no indication because it's a long way apart and there ain't email to check up on one another. There ain't the holiday letter coming to say this year in Esau's life. You know, there's none of that. It's a risk to go home. And it's a risk that God calls Jacob to take. He says, I want you to go back to your family. I am with you. The blessing that I promised you, you shall receive because I shall give it to you, not because you shall strong arm people to get it. How you doing? Let's read read some of the story and then make a few observations. We're going to start in verse 55 of chapter 31. Jacob's packing up his family and he's heading back to face his past. Early in the morning, Laban arose and kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned home. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's camp, Machanayim. So he called the name of the place Machanayim. This is God's camp. Okay, so (laughs) Jacob leaves after 20 years of animosity within his uncle's family, being tricked several times over, tricking them several times over, and they kiss and they leave. There's a kind of resolution. And Jacob starts his way back home. What's the first thing that happens as Jacob takes that first step towards facing his past. What's the first thing that happens in the narrative? God's messengers appear to this man. And it's an odd little story. Nothing else is told. But Jacob does what he always does when he has an encounter with the divine. He names the place. (laughs) He'll do it again in a few moments. He did it on his way here. He names the place. This is camps. That's what Machanayim means, camps. We're not told what these messengers did or said. But I like to think, and I'm not alone in this, that his eyes, this is an attempt to open his eyes. You're going back, and it's going to be very frightening. I'm with you. I'm with you. In fact, God's messengers attend you on your journey back to face the damage you've done, and the pains, the pain you carry. God is with you. And the text moves on, and that is strange, in my opinion. And by the way, the, the narrator, the writers of this story have worked really hard to conceal a lot from you and I. There's much in this you're going to see that we will not be able to explain very well. It's very elusive, and I think that's part of the point. Let's read on. And Jacob, after meeting God's messengers, Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, in the country of Edom, instructing them, thus you shall say, now look at this, to my Lord, not my older brother, to my Lord Esau. Thus says your servant Jacob. Well, that's a change. Thus says your servant Jacob. I have sojourned with Laban, and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants, and female servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I might find favor in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob 
We came to your brother Esau. He's coming to meet you. And there are 400 men with him. (laughs) Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people who were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps, thinking, if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. So look at this. First thing that happens, an encounter with God. The next thing, trying to be deferential, to extend the olive branch. Older brother, my Lord, your servant has come with all of this wealth to, to find favor in your eyes. He sends the messengers out, and they meet Esau. He says, my younger brother, I'll be right there. They come back ahead of him and say he's on his way. There's 400 dudes with him. <laughs> Jacob is in a position that he is not going to get out of without some help as far as he's concerned. It says he's greatly afraid and trembled. He's terrified. 20 years of accumulating all this, 20 years of agony with my uncle Laban, only now to have half of it, I'm going to split them up, that's what I do, I plan and prepare and strategize so I can save at least half of my family and my wealth, but half of them are probably going to die. It's over. My, My sons, my wives, My wealth, my older brother is going to come and pay me back for what I did to him. And I can't fight 400 men. I'm wealthy, but these ain't soldiers. So look what Jacob does. Jacob does something, and it's the first time we've seen it in the Bible so far in Genesis. Uh, Look at this in verse 9. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. I'm not worthy of the least of all the deeds of the steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, that is the river, and now I've become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother." From the hand of Esau, for I fear that he may come and attack me. The mothers with the children. But you, you said you would do good. Yes, do good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Jacob prays. And we haven't seen, this is new. This is new for God's people. It's a prayer of distress. It's very similar to what we see in that big, long, uh, liturgical text in the middle of our Bible called the Psalms. It's very similar. It could be summarized, I suppose, as, I am scared to death. You said you'd take care of me. You have so far. I am not even worthy of what you've done. Keep it up. I am scared to death. It's simple and it's beautiful. And it arises out of Jacob's own anxiety. I didn't mention this. But we, if we've been reading along, know that God had promised to bless Jacob instead of Esau right from the jump. But Jacob's been trying to grab hold of God's blessings on his own. Now, God has worked with him, but he's finally in a position where he's out of gas. There's no plan or ten steps he can formulate to get out of his tight spot. He's at the mercy of of his brother. There's no 10-step plan for Jacob to deal quickly with his past. Just like, by the way, there's no 10-step plan for you or for your church to get out of whatever situation it's in. The only help you may have is to ask God. And to be honest, I'm scared to death. I am scared to death. I need you to keep doing what you've been doing. He turns to God and he says the faithfulness. This is a phrase that gets uh, tossed in the air in celebration of who God is over and over throughout Scripture, all the way up to the gospel, grace and truth. I'm not worthy of what you've done. This is already kind of a different Jacob. This is already a slightly softened version of the masterful, carefully, Uh, planning, calculating Jacob. He's in need, and he sought God out. 
Okay, how you doing? You all right? So we stayed there. So he stayed there that night. And from what he had with him, and he took a present for his older brother, 200 female goats. Imagine traveling with that much livestock. And 20 male goats, 200... <laughs> I know it's you, but I always want to say ew. Two, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milking camels and their calves, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 milking camels and their calves, 40, I'm sorry, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. These he handed over to his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servant, pass on ahead of me, and put a space between drove and drove. And he instructed the first, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, to whom do you belong and where are you going? And whose are these ahead of you? Then you shall say, they belong to your servant, to Jacob. They are a present sent to my Lord Esau. Moreover, he is behind us. He likewise instructed the second and the third and all who followed the droves. You shall say the same thing to Esau when you find him. You shall say, moreover, your servant Jacob's behind us. For he thought, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me. And afterward, I shall see his face and perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him and he himself stayed that night in the camp. That same night, he took his two wives, his two female servants, his 11 children, and crossed the ford at Yabok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else he had, and Jacob was left alone. Okay, Jacob utters this prayer uh, for the mercy of for God to show mercy. And did he trust what he had said and asked or not? What would you do? He still has to have a plan for maybe for God to bless and help him. But he moves right out of the prayer to, okay, all right, uh, let's, let's make a present. Let's split up. You guys go ahead. This is what I want you to say. It's all scripted out. Let him know I'm coming soon. These are a gift from me. Like, let's... Let's really try to, uh, the text says, cover my brother's face so that I may see his face and he may cause his face to shine upon me. And he does all of the planning and he leads his family and his possessions drove by drove across the Yabok. Now, Yabok actually looks a lot like, in Hebrew, Yaakov. Uh, there's a lot of wordplay happening. He leads them across this river and he sends them off and it says that he was alone. And this is when the hard stuff happens. I want to go back to you for a minute. When we're alone. When the fellowship is quieted down. When the day is done. When we're faced with however we are. When we're alone. <laughs> I think the text is intentional here. When Jacob has done all he could... And he's now got to sit with not knowing how it's going to go. He's going to do that alone. I'm not sure why he didn't go with one of the groups, but he stays back. And it's night, and he's alone. And look what happens next. We're almost done, I promise. You've got to read this whole thing. We can't stop halfway. You wouldn't sleep. All right, here we go. Uh, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him. You saw that coming, right? <laughs> and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. The word wrestled is yavik. It looks a lot like yabok. It looks a lot like yakov. Uh, Jacob is yavaking at the yabok. Yaakov is yavaking at the yabok. Uh, with a man. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. There he is. There's our Jacob. I will not let you go until you bless me. And he said to him, well, what's your name? Now, Jacob was asked this earlier. What's your name? He said, Yaakov. 
Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Yaakov, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, saying, for I have seen the face of God, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him, and as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip, uh, therefore to this day the people of Israel do not eat the sinew at the thigh that is on the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. What in the world? What are you supposed to make of this story? He sends all his family. He's afraid of dying. And once the deed's done and he's done all he can and he's got to just sit now alone at night, what do you expect would happen next? A man attacks him. <laughs> and almost, I don't know how to envision this in my mind. I kind of picture him waving and then like someone nailing him and like a wrestling match begins. And they wrestle all night long. So a couple of questions. Who's the man? <laughs> Where did he come from? And why? <laughs> what, what is the point here? This guy has gone through enough. Well, th there's so much discussion about this passage, as you can imagine. But it seems like this man, guess who it is? It's, it's God. It's God. God appears as men. You know this already, though. He's done it in chapter 18 of Genesis. God shows up not to say, Jacob, I see all the hard work you put into this plan, and I'm with you, brother. I love you, my son. I'm going to deliver you from Esau. Don't be afraid. It's okay. No. He tackles him. <laughs> He throws him to the ground, and he pulls his hip out of socket. Some think the image here is of, of God punching Jacob in the genitals, that actually this limp has to do with, with uh, rendering him like, like yeah, you, you know the image. But in any case, it seems as if it wasn't too much of, too difficult for this man to maim hard-headed Jacob. Jacob keeps fighting with God. God is making it so he can't walk straight anymore. And does Jacob say, I've had enough. I've had enough. You win. No, that wouldn't be Jacob. He keeps fighting with God. Can you handle a few rounds in the ring with God? Could you do that? Jacob does. He fights with God. And he won't let him go says, I need you to bless me. He says, what's your name? He says, you will be called Israel. Oh, there we have it. The whole story of the Bible is based on a group of people named Israel. And what do they do? They fight with God over and over and over. Jacob, at his lowest moment, has to fight God? Come on. That does not sound like the sort of God I want to go to a building and worship. See, God is doing something. I don't know what, but God is doing something in Jacob. I love what J.I. Packer has said about the scene. He says that Jacob's, the beauty of Jacob here is that he held on to God while God weakened him. God is perhaps putting to death in Jacob his sense of self-sufficiency. I can get it done with a plan and some energy. I can get it done with a good plan and a prayer. God is showing Jacob, you're limping out of this battle, dude. And that's your badge of honor, that limp. You limp over the hill to meet your brother. God weakens Jacob, until he's willing to surrender, he seeks a blessing from the only one who could bless him. And he receives a new name. Now we'll read on. He'll still be called Jacob 66 more times in the book of Genesis. Uh, and he's not really that changed of a guy after this, believe it or not. 
Which leads me to believe that even one wrestling match with God won't change you. It's a lifetime. We quickly forget what happens in our lives. But Jacob now can go face his brother. Having wrestled God, he's in a place where he can go meet his brother. We don't see Jacob afraid anymore if you read on. The fear of his brother is kind of evaporated. And now you just see this. Oh, I forgot to mention this. Jacob is 97 years old at this point. So don't think that transformation and facing your past is a young man's game. Uh, it may happen late in your life. But Jacob is now going to limp for the rest of his life. And that limp is a sign of God's power in Jacob's life. That inability, that inability to deliver himself. He will always remember, and anyone who watches Jacob make his way toward them will say, there's a man who's fought God and found the answer. You ever meet someone with a limp, spiritually speaking? You ever meet these, these folks? We need, to, we need to preserve and protect them because they're our guides and teachers. Those who have fought with God over the course of their life and limped out of there and lived to tell about all the things God has done, teaching them how weak they are, teaching them that they can't do it on their own. That's what God's after. That doesn't happen at baptism. That doesn't happen in your studies. We can't inculcate that quickly in a message or in a sermon or in a Bible study for somebody. That's a project which will take the whole of your life if, if you're up for it. Or you could just stay on the surface and keep manipulating your way through life. But if you sit alone for a moment, and I've been trying to do this. I know I'm running long. I always do. It's the way of uh, a windbag like myself. So I'm almost done. I've, I've noticed this in my life. I've been learning the practice of uh, contemplative or like centering prayer. You familiar with this? Um, but it's a practice of stilling yourself. And as your thoughts go past, you try not to jump a hold of them. You try to clear your mind. Like no, trying to set yourself before God not worrying about everything that you've not done, everything, all your failures, all the things that need to get done, but trying to part the fog in a way so that you might sit and perhaps be present with God. I know how it sounds until I started to do it. And I found that when my mind clears for even a moment, I am scared to death. I am scared all the way deep down. There are so many things that I have unresolved issue with, namely dying. <laughs> like trusting God with my very life. Like so much of my behavior is, grows out of, I still have deep fears. I wouldn't have known had I not sit still. But I think this, I think this is what God's calling the church to. I think it's what he's always been calling the church to. Not get baptized, get out there and save the world. But your baptism is, is, a, is an opportunity to now live into a new creation and to become people who are themselves new creatures. But that comes by wrestling God. At some level, that comes as striving with God and losing, being overcome and defeated by God until the, the brother that's coming to kill you with 400 men is no longer frightening to you because you trust God enough and you saw real power and you're no longer scared of the things that used to control you. I, you should go read on what happens. But I want to close with this because here's what happens as we deepen ourselves with God, as we open ourselves up to actually walking with the Lord and allowing him to confront and address all that is in us, even the things we're not aware of. Here's what I think happens. It's summarized best by the Chronicles of Narnia. Little Lucy meets Aslan, the big lion, 
later in life, much later. The lion represents God in these stories. And Lucy meets him, and look at, look at this exchange. Welcome, child, he said. Aslan, said Lucy, you're bigger. That's because you are older, little one, answered he. Not because you are? I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. That's what it's like to walk with God honestly and openly. God doesn't get older. But as we walk with God, we find him larger, more complicated, more hard to get our hands around, bigger, undomesticated, untamed, dangerous, loving, kind, trustworthy, faithful. We find our God to be one who breaks every category. But we find that as we grow with him. He gets bigger, not us. We can't grasp who God is in one sitting, in one study, or in one moment, or at conversion. That For that, you will need to strap on your big boy or big girl pants and walk with God. Now let's have the Lord's Supper. And I don't think I have to draw too clean of a line from this to Jesus' life and the cross. You could maybe hear what Hebrews says, that in Jesus' days, he cried out with loud petitions, and he learned obedience. How? Do you know this, how this passage goes? From what he suffered. You can hear the Lord in Gethsemane wrestling, weakening, trusting his Father. Our, our Lord has faced all that we shall face. And he's done it on our behalf. Jesus is Israel, a people who wrestle with and trust God. And our salvation grows out of this wrestling match where Jesus fought his deepest fear and trusted God, and the result was resurrection. We eat this meal, I hope, you can eat this meal with sincere gratitude and with a sense of wonder uh, because it is amazing what we have in this little thimble. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for this rich text. We thank you for stories of men uh, who have survived confronting their fears. We thank you, God, that fear and death and loss and pain shall not have the last word in our lives or in creation. We thank you, God, that the cross and the resurrection is evidence of a good future. And we pray, Father, as we, as we sit and we, we try to remember the Lord, we try to uh, imagine the depth of this meal, that we are, we are changed, that we, we try, Father, to become as you are. Help us, God. Energize us with this food and drink. Help us to cling to you. Help us to not let go through turbulent times, God. Help us to confront uh, with courage, uh, all of the fear and doubt which lives in us. We thank you, God, that you've overcome. We thank you that you've become a source of salvation for the whole world. And we pray uh, in amazement of that fact. In Jesus' name, amen.